again, everyone. We're uh, always pleased to be in the house of the Lord. <laughs> it's a good place to be. And uh, we do think very seriously on the prayer requests. And sometimes it makes some water in our eyes. <laughs> um, I told last week that, uh, I told people that I enjoy teaching. I was over there in, in Worcester, Oklahoma, and I said, that uh, I don't know how good of a pastor preacher I am, but I sure love to teach the Bible and to teach things. Uh, so uh, I hope you'll bear with me as we go through some more <laughs> teaching. Uh, this church here really loves truth, and we hear it all the time. We're always talking about truth of the scriptures and reading of the scriptures, so that everybody has the depth in the scriptures, so that we can visit with each other, have a lot of fun with the scripture. So uh, I even get to teasing about the scriptures, and if I find a young person, I ask him if they know who the shortest man in the Bible was. And they start thinking, was it the guy that climbed the tree? You know, No, 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 it was uh, Job's friend, Bill Dad the Shuhite. <laughs> uh, it helps us remember one more name from the Bible, I guess. <laughs> We've got to have fun with our learning of the scriptures. Well, today I'm going to be talking about another teaching of the Bible, a truth of the Bible. And uh, I don't know how many we could put into the, the list of truths, whether there's 40 or what you'd say. It's just much like the, uh, what is a Christian expected to do? Well, there's Christian characteristics. And some say, oh, you can't do all the laws of the Old Testament. You know, they, uh, <laughs> they say, how about the New Testament? There's but 66 or more Christian characteristics that we're supposed to be doing. And they, they look at you kind of think, well, what are those? Well, love, joy, peace, gentleness, pray without ceasing, you know. You <laughs> uh, there's uh, things that we're supposed to be doing. Anyway, uh, today is a lesson on the pre-existence of Christ. And every once in a while I have to put in a different idea because next week or the week after I'll be speaking on Mother's Day, right? So <laughs> um, I guess us men better smarten up that we got to do something for the ladies that day. But anyway, uh, <laughs> brighten our ideas for that day. But the pre-existence of Christ. Some people don't believe that he existed before he was born of Mary. We say, whoa, wait a minute now, there's quite a few verses, aren't there? Quite a few verses about Jesus, other ways. Well, actually, surprising, quite a few in the Old Testament. And then there's ones in the New Testament. So I've got quite a few verses. Some I'm going to read just as is from my paper that I've printed out. Some I'll have to go to the scriptures, uh, to the Bible. I like to do a lot of Bible. What's a sermon without Bible in it? <coughs> Somebody's idea. <laughs> but, okay, we want it more than that. We want scripture to be read. So I want to start with, uh, with Matthew. Part of these are kind of a story form, and uh, part are, are um, uh, just text that I want to hit on or, or note, take note of. So this one's in Matthew 22. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 22. And I'm going to start on verse 41. Verse 41. So I'll tell part of the story and kind of half read it and so on so that I can move right along. Matthew 22, verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? The reason this is important is because the word Christ is the word Messiah from the Old Testament. And they were looking for a Messiah to come, a Savior, somebody that would save them from the Romans. Well, actually, he's going to save them from more than that, right? <laughs> he was going to be the Lamb that could really, really save them spiritually. But anyway, he's asking them, uh, who do you think this Christ is? And if the Christ was a man coming from some family line, which is the normal thinking, right? We're not defaulting him for that. That's the normal thinking. Whose son is he? You know, which path did he come through? Which family heritage did he come through? Or would he come through? So whose son is he? And they said unto him, the son of David. 
So they're definitely thinking, earthly thinking, right? The family line, you know, you go down through the patriarchs of the Old Testament and you get to David. And so they, David's the one that he'll come from. There's Bible verses on that, right? That the Messiah will come from the lineage of David. And Jesus said to them, now here's, <laughs> here starts a, a question that's going to go pretty deep in their minds. How then doth David in the spirit, David with God's spirit touching his mind, call him? The Lord saying, The Lord saith uh, unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And you think, okay, we've got to think this through. There's two kinds of words being said here. Which one's which is what he's wanting them to think on. And also, the one of these, this, this Messiah is going to come, that the Heavenly Father is going to say to him, I'll make your enemies the footstool. There's going to be a number of verses with that in. And I want you to lock on to them every time you get there. Say, oh, look at there, look at there, another verse. Because that's going to identify the Messiah, the real Lord. Okay. So here he's saying, you need to consider what was written there in David's writing. He was writing under the inspiration of the Heavenly Father or the Holy Spirit. And he's saying this, saying, the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. This is Yahweh. This is Jehovah God. Said unto my Lord, David's Lord, this lower Lord, like the owner of the land. Okay, this kind of a Lord. Capital L, small O, small R, small D. So we're identifying between the Heavenly Father and this other earthly Lord. And he says to uh, sit thou on my right hand. Oh no, this is not this earthly small Lord. This is somebody else that's able to sit on the right hand of the Heavenly Father. You see, Jesus is getting their minds going, right? Think this through, he's saying. Well, we need you too, right? And that's a direct quote from Psalms. Psalms 110, verse 1. I probably won't go there. Save me a little time, okay? But uh, this is the exact quote from there. Same words. Verse 45 then. If David then called him Lord, how is it he is his... How is he his son? If David is talking about this other person that's very powerful... Uh, has a kingdom on earth, you know, uh, owns land or whatever, uh, he must be older than David, right? So how can David say he's my son? See, Jesus is really getting it to sink in. You've got to think this through. What is this family line? How did that Bible verse work? We know it's Jesus Christ. And we know it's the Messiah. You know, that makes it easy to fill in. But we've got to have proof for that, right? And I hope to give you some more verses on those. Anyway, uh, I want to go on uh, uh, to the last verse, and I'll well read it. And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> Jesus is going to ask questions back that are going to be profound, and they weren't going to be able to think through it very well, okay? And we, we know that their eyes were blinded, otherwise they would make Jesus the king. And it spoil everything. Uh, he needed to die for our salvation. He could not be a king and fight against the Roman government. I mean, that, that was the wrong direction. That was not his job. But we keep that in mind. If the, they, they did find out that Jesus was a special person, they couldn't even answer his questions. Okay, in that verse it said... Uh, uh, about the footstool, make thy enemies thy footstool as well, was that in verse 44. Uh, until, you sit on my right hand, until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Watch out for the word footstool, because that's going to be somebody special as well. That everything else is going to be his footstool. Very special person. Okay, but go with me to Acts chapter um, 2. Acts chapter 2. I 
put little papers in here and sometimes that gets me in trouble. <laughs> it's supposed to help. Chapter 2, verse uh, 34. And I'll read 34, 35, and 36 here. Okay, in Acts chapter 2. For David is not ascended into heaven, into the heavens. I, I love to talk about this with some people that believe as soon as you die, you go straight to heaven. And you know, if it was a very bad person that just died, they, they send them to heaven anyway because they want to be polite, I guess. <laughs> David didn't make it. He was a man after God's own heart. But he's not gone to heaven. That's what that verse says. So we've got to be careful about truth and what we state. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord saith unto my Lord, you see the same verse there, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Same wording there. This is a special person, special uh, Lord, capital L, small O, small R, small D. Who is this person? Uh, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord, small O-R-D, and Christ. He's identifying who this person was. He said, God said this. The, the Heavenly Father, the Yahweh God, Jehovah God, whatever we want to call him, that God said to somebody else, I'm going to do this and this for you. And then right here in Acts, it's identified who it is. That God hath made that same Jesus that you know, Jesus right here, that you've just crucified. That he's made him Lord and Christ, the Messiah and the Lord of the New Testament, the Lord of everybody. The Lord of everybody. Uh, I often say we need to let Jesus or make Jesus our Lord, our Master, and our Savior. Some people want to try to take one and not the others. Oh, you got to take all three. Okay, uh, let's go down to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. In verse 25. It's talking about Jesus because if you go up to verse 23, it talks about the, the Christ at his coming. Christ is the first fruits. Yeah, let's look at verse 23. Because even above that, Christ is risen in verse 20 and verse 22. Christ shall be made, uh, shall all be made alive. Uh, he's the one that's able to save us and bring us back to life. In verse 23, uh, he's the first fruits. That sounds kind of funny because I even mentioned that last week too in the sermon in, in Worcester. But the, uh, Jesus died just like other people in the Old Testament died. And somebody, a prophet or someone, prayed for him and he came back to life. And you go to New Testament, Jesus said the same thing. Somebody died and he brought him back to life. How can Jesus be first fruits? He's the first one that doesn't have to re-die. He's got his spiritual body. He's going to go to the Father. He doesn't have to re-die. So somebody here we could bring back to life, like the guy that fell out of the window and the preacher was too long, <coughs> too long winded. Fell out of the window and fell down and died. They got him up and brought him back to life. But he had to re-die again. When he got old, he had to re-die. Jesus is not going to re-die. He's risen. And he's the first fruits of those that will come to, to a spiritual life and to a spiritual body. Okay, uh, and, and we also afterwards, it says afterwards they that are Christ, if you belong to Christ, at his, at his coming. So when Jesus comes, the graves are going to open, they're going to start rising up, the dead in Christ will rise with them, they'll be him in the air and in the clouds. They didn't leave the earth. They didn't go out to the moon. They didn't go beyond the moon. There's churches that teach that. That there'll be a seven day trip between here and, and heaven and go past all the planets and that you'll celebrate a Sabbath on the way. And, uh, where's that verse? 
Never did find it. <laughs> um, okay, at his coming, Jesus will call us uh, back to, to life. Verse 24, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, delivered up to the Father, to God, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. There, same connection with those other verses, with putting down all power and all authority, and then when his enemies are put down, then he will be able to do something different. But he will reign until then. Reign. He's going to be king of kings and lord of lords. Where? On the earth. Only over the righteous? Oh. No. Because he's going to rule with a rod of iron. There's going to be some wicked people there. Some will die at the brightness of his coming, but he's coming to rule on this earth. He will be a king of kings and lord of lords. And then... And we could look elsewhere in the Bible and find out it's a thousand years long. He's going to turn this kingdom of his over to the Heavenly Father. So let's go just a little further. The last en enemy shall be destroyed is death. If you're reading in the book of Revelation, you'll find where he throws death and the grave into the pit, into the um, fire. And Satan goes in the fire as well and so on. Verse 27. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifested that he is accepted, Christ is the one, uh, which did put all things under him. So God accepts him as the one that's able to do it, and Jesus accepts his job. Verse 28, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, this is Jesus, then he sh then shall the Son also himself be subject to him that put all things under him. That's the Heavenly Father, Yahweh. That God, Yahweh, may be all in all. Jesus is going to give up everything that he's got. He's perfected it. He's fixed it. He's cured it. Got rid of all the bad stuff. Now he's presenting it to his Father. The Heavenly Father. Okay. So we could go on, this would get excited, but we, we must uh, carry on on this topic. Okay, and cut down to here, let's go. I'll just read this verse from here. In Hebrews 1, verse 13, it says, But to which of the angels said he at any time, that's the Heavenly Father, at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. There's a challenge here. Go back through the Bible and find any verse where the Heavenly Father said to an angel, do this and this, and I'm going to make you have this and this. Because it's not there. Jesus is the only one. He's not an angel. Okay? So this starts us on a path of who Jesus is. What's his authority? What's his power? Where did he come from? So we try to go through that kind of a path. So we know that he is not an angel. Uh, in Hebrews uh, 10, verse 12, says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin, forever sat down on the right hand of God. This man, this Jesus. The book of Hebrews is going through showing that Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than Abraham. Jesus is this and this until he's saying, This man is the Savior. This Jesus is the Savior. He's the one that God talks to. And actually verse 13 in that same place, Hebrews 10 verse 13, uh, from henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. We're back to the King of Kings, Lord of Lord. Okay, this is that person, that's Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 12, let's go to Acts chapter 12. Did I say Acts? I meant Mark. Uh, Mark chapter 12. Mark 12 and verse 35. Did I say it again? Mark. Mark chapter 12, 35. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught the, in the temple, 
How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself saith by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit talking through David, and David writing, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So I've explained a lot about that. Verse 37, David therefore himself calleth him Lord, that's capital L, small O, small R, small D. And whence is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. They saw that Jesus was teaching from the Psalms, which everybody's supposed to know, and they sing in church and all of this. And uh, the, the common folk, they thought, this is great to hear this again. This is just one more verse with the same idea that, that Jesus would have the... Um, to be able to make the enemies his footstools with the help of the Heavenly Father. And uh, I've got here chapter, uh, let's just make sure I've read to 37. Yeah, read to 37. Okay, now I want to start on some more verses that will take us another direction. In Colossians 1 verse 15 and verse 17, let's well turn there with me. Colossians it's not too hard to find out. <laughs> Smaller chapters sometimes want to hide a little bit. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. There we go. Okay. Chapter 1, verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Some worry about the wording here, but if you go back to verse 13 too, it begins to say, His dear Son. We know that he's talking about Jesus Christ, God's Son. And then uh, in verse 14, In whom we have redemption. We know that's Jesus. Through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. And then we have this verse, that Jesus is the firstborn of every creature. And we say, oh, don't say that. Well, why not? Jesus was ahead of everything. Yes. We don't know how he came into existence. The Heavenly Father always existed. We can't understand that, okay? Jesus was next to him, and we can't understand how far back. We're not trying to belittle Jesus at all with these words right here in the King James. We're not trying to shrink that at all. But he's second. And we're somewhere later. Okay. So then we go a little further here. For by him, by Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things are created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So if Jesus was creating things and for himself and for the good of people, for the Heavenly Father, he was doing the work, uh, whatever it is, he was back here somewhere. Before anything else happened, before Genesis 1-1, where God created light, he was back there somewhere. We're not shrinking him, not the slightest, in some of these words here, but he uses the word creature. Okay, that's... English just can't come up with enough words to identify these things. Okay. I used to tell my little daughter, I love you little critter. And she wasn't a critter. <laughs> I'd hold her by both arms, I love you little critter. Uh, until she got big enough that she did it to me. And not love me quite so hard. Uh, we're not trying to diminish. My daughter was not a critter. It's just a loving statement or just English that doesn't have enough words to identify. So we're not trying to diminish anything here at all. He was ahead of everything. He was the firstborn. Uh, Revelations 3.14 says that he was the beginning of the creation of God. That's true. Whatever God did to have his son come into existence, we don't want to start down some path that we're thinking just human. We're trying to put God in a box and say, okay, now it's a glass box so we're going to analyze. You can't do that. Way beyond human minds and reasoning. Yes. But Jesus was back there somewhere. And he came into existence at the will of the Heavenly Father. 
In John 1.1 1, 1, it says he was in the beginning. Probably before the beginning if we wanted to say it that way. <laughs> because when God saw that the earth needed to be created and he started with creating light and he started doing things, Jesus was already there with him. Okay. In Genesis 1 and verse 26, let us make man in our image. Jesus is, is there with the Father, and the Father is saying, let's make man that looks like us. Not one eye in the middle of the forehead, and one ear and not the other, and one hand and not the other. You know, um, How do you know what God looks like? Right there, take a look around. Okay, we've got a tremendous variety, but we all have two eyes, and we all have a nose, we have two nostrils, and we all have two ears, and... God is not a scary person like they try to show you in these stupid movies from other planets. That's man's imagination. The Bible talks about God's hand and his eye and his ears, hearing. And, you know, well, we know what God is like. He made us in his image. What a phenomenal design that God made for us. Who are we that he should think of that much of us? Okay, we keep going. In John 1, 3, and Ephesians 3, 9, and Colossians 1, 16, so I can just go a little quick here. By him were all things made. And we know that's the Heavenly Father, but also Jesus Christ. He was right there with him. Okay. And uh, turn with me to John 17. I've got a few verses in John, so we might as well go to John. John chapter 17. And verse 5. Now, and now, O Father, glorify thou me. He's talking to his heavenly Father, to his God. Glorify me uh, with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, before creation of this earth. Anything else that we see and understand. Stars, the whole business. So we don't know how far back we go, right? Jesus was there with him. And he had glory back then. He had his glory with the Father back then. Okay, good things to just lock on to some of those words that are there. Verse 24. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them, this is Jesus' prayer, you know, uh, I have declared unto them thy name, the name of the Heavenly Father is important. And will declare it. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. He's talking to the Heavenly Father about this tremendous closeness between the Heavenly Father and himself. This love that was going on. This togetherness. The real companionship. Working together. Doing things in harmony. He said, I'd like that same to be with my disciples, with those that will follow after me. And I in them. Jesus says he wants to be in us, to be part of us. And we know that's true through the power of the Holy Spirit when that comes upon us. John chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verse 31. And he that cometh from above is above all. That's Jesus Christ. Nobody else came from above. He that is of the earth is earthy, earthly. That's true. We came from the earth. We're part of this earth. We're part of the dirt, in fact, and the dust. <laughs> Uh, and speaketh of the earth. We only understand the earth's things and things that we have learned from the earth and from science of the earth. And so on. That, that's where we're at. 
He that cometh from above is above all. This is put, putting Jesus in his correct status, right? He's above all, above everything else. In John chapter 6, 62. John 6, 62. For some reason or other, I did not put a paper in there. Uh, 62. Um, okay. It reads this way. What and if ye should shall see the Son of Man ascending up where he was before. He came down from there. He can go back to where he had been. So you can lock in on some of these terms that Jesus has that ability to go back to where he had been with the Heavenly Father. Okay, then uh, John 8. John 8, 58. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. You need to read the little story above. Two or three verses there. He's talking about himself and, and uh, they're teasing him and jiding him. He said, are, are you older than Abraham? Because Jesus said that he knew him and Abraham knew him. And he says, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. But the Father would give him honor. That's in verse 54 and then 55. Yet uh, ye have not known him, but I know him. He's talking about his heavenly Father. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep his sayings. Okay, I do know that far back. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now they're going to get angry. You say that you and Abraham know each other, that you've met, you've talked. He understands your deed. 57. And then the Jews, uh, then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Then comes 58 with a punchline. And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was I am. Before Abraham's time, before he lived. I'm before that. Of course. He was there at creation helping to make man. But they wanted to really make trouble out of that. They picked up stones and were going to stone him right there on the spot. And Jesus vanished from their sight. In Luke chapter 1, 34 and 35, it talks about Mary was told of Jesus' birth. That's fine. That's a history of, of Jesus coming into this world. How did he come in? Was he going to come uh, in great power and authority? No. The Old Testament says he's going to be born of a virgin. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be you know, a Nazarite. And so uh, all those sayings have to come true as well. Even though he did live far before that. He had his glory far before that. In, uh, in John 3.13 and John 16, it says that he came from heaven and that he will return to heaven. I won't take time to read those, so I've got just one more verse. In Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 6. The 5 would be nice. <laughs> okay. Um, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. We've got to set this mindset needs to be ours. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was the Son of God. How much higher can you get? He didn't have to be the Heavenly Father. Why bother? Why fight the situation? I'm already the Son of God. Extreme power and authority. Second in command of the universe, I, my language, my words. Uh, that's all he needed. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation. He didn't take that pride and authority. He let it alone. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, not the son, a servant, and was made in the likeness of men and in the, uh, and being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. 
Wherefore God, God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of the things in heaven, and the things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.